210. So we're going to try to squeeze as much as possible. And uh, just by show of hands, how many people here were here seven years ago for the first Renewable Energy Summit? We've got a couple of you. Well, great. Uh, I was here for the second, and uh, one of the things that I remember at that time is that uh, we sat here in a room and we talked about uh, a number of things, and uh, we looked out at the landscape and we said, one of the things we need to have is more renewables. Wouldn't it be great if we had a lot of utility-scale solar projects? And uh, we need to do some things to try to do some training so that we get some people put to work on some of these projects. And certainly we're going to need to do something about transmission so if we build all these things, we have a way to get them to the other markets. And then certainly the last thing we're going to need to do is start to reinvigorate our agricultural community to diversify it into new types of industries. Well, as we look here seven years now, later, I'd say it's check, 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 check. And I think we were, what we heard by this morning's comments is that we're now on to a new challenge, and that's what today's panel is all about. And the themes that I picked up from uh, this morning's conversation is that we're going to be talking over the next seven years about the water energy nexus, energy storage, base load power, salt and sea remediation, and of course, the duck chart. And so uh, we've got a distinguished group of panelists with us today that are all playing in different aspects of this, including sustainable fuels. And I want to make some brief introductions, and each of them are going to make roughly a 10-minute presentation. Hopefully, they'll leave enough time at the end of the presentation for some questions. Our first presenter will be Scott Musgrave. Scott is the founder and COO of Enritec LLC, and Scott has a, a seasoned entrepreneurial background. He started several ventures, including most recently, recently Digital Streets, which is an innovative fiber-to-home service provider. And Scott's going to spend some time talking with us about his company goal to take uh, a revolutionary pyrolysis technology and bring it to a project here in Imperial Valley. Our second presenter is Bruce Anderson. Bruce is the chief executive officer. This is Bruce right here. Scott, Scott is right here. Bruce is the uh, co-founder and chairman of CEO of Wilson Solar Power in Western Virginia. Wilson is commercializing a modular, cold competitive concentrated solar power CSB system based on two MIT innovative clean energy technologies, an ultra-efficient industrial heat engine and an ultra-efficient microturbine. Bruce started his career 40 years ago when he completed his master's thesis at MIT on solar energy in 1973. Twelve years later, Bruce became the first recipient of the American Solar Energy Society's Lifetime Solar Contribution Award. He was a founding director of the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association, then the New England Solar Energy Association. He authored and self-published the New York Times bestseller, The, Sol the Solar Home Book, authored sev seven other energy books, served on the National Advisory Board of the Solar Energy Research Institute, now NREL, and has twice testified to Congress on energy matters. Our third presenter will be Dr. Rajesh Nalore, he is the chief executive from Geitz Corporation. Dr. Nalore. He is the chief executive officer of Geitz Corporation, a sustainable infrastructure company that has offered solutions in power, water, and waste. And he's going to be talking to us today about his concept for floating solar power. He served as the vice president and head of Indian operations for PSA Peugeot Citroen between 2008 and 2011. Prior to this, he served in various positions with Johnson Controls based in France between 2000 and 2008 and served as general manager purchasing and quality in his last assignment. He, was also, he also served in various positions with General Motors, Saab, and Fiat, such as product development, purchasing, platform director for alternative fuels, and telematics across Sweden, US, USA, France, Italy, and Belgium between 1985 and 2004. He holds an undergraduate degree in electronics engineering from India, a postgraduate diploma in international business from the University of Birmingham in the UK, and an MBA from the University of Wales in the UK, as well as a doctorate from the University of Newcastle in the United Kingdom. And finally, our last presenter is Tracy Sizemore. He's the Vice President of Development for Symbol Materials. Tracy comes to Symbol Materials with over 25 years of multinational experience with various chemical companies. He's having that same business development experience with Symbol, and he's going to talk to us today about an innovative way that they're approaching extracting uh, materials from waste brine on geothermal plants. He is a 
a hydro hydro hydrogeologist and geochemist from uh, Nebraska University. So that's our panelist, and I'd like to go ahead and start with Scott Musgrave. So if you put EnterTech up first, please. Thank you. Scott? <clears throat> How do I click? I'm going to bring you up. All right. The right is forward. Left it, is forward. Exactly. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for your your attendance here. Um, as Rick said, I am uh, Scott Musgrave. I'm the chief operating officer and one of the founders of Enritech. Enritech is a waste conversion technology company. Uh, we actually process and convert plastic waste into oil. The product that we produce is a West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil. So at this seventh annual renewable conference, I can probably say that I am one of the only companies here that is in the oil production business. So, um, let's see if we can get this to work. Wrong way. <laughs> No, it's the left and right ones. These, these guys here. Those. Okay. Left and right. Yeah. Got it. Right is forward. There we go. <coughs> so, uh, Enritech is uh, the implementation arm of a technology that was created by a company called Res Polyflow. Res Polyflow is the inventor of the technology and the owner of the patents. Enritech is the uh, implementation arm for this part of the country. Res Polyflow is actually also a joint venture partner within Enertech, so part owner, and uh, you've got Res Polyflow now with the, uh, the creation of the technology, Enertech as the actual implementer and operator. Um, we are, our, our model and our plan and what we're doing is opening facilities throughout the, uh, this part of the country, including the Imperial Valley where we've got a processing facility that we've got uh, in the process of uh, planning to open. So let's talk a little bit so, about some, some waste statistics. Uh, in the U.S., on an annual basis, uh, we produce about 250 million tons a year of waste. That gets either landfilled or going through the recycling facilities. Of that, 12% or roughly 29 million tons is plastic, and that's our interest. In California, we produce about 30 million tons of waste total. Now, California has a fairly high diversion rate across the state, it's about 52%. So applying that, that means there's about 1.9 million tons that we work with uh, in the state of California. That's our world, and that's, the, that's what we have access to. Now, that's just the the known waste stream. There's a lot of other access to plastic waste that's, uh, you know, they call the unknown. But that 1.9 million is, is our world and where we live. <clears throat> a little bit about the technology. Uh, the Res Polyflow uh, technology it is a what's called uh, pyrolysis, which means it operates in a non-oxygen uh, environment. Uh, we do not use any sort of catalyst, so the plastic waste is uh, processed all by itself. It's a continuous feed process compared to uh, some pyrolysis processes or what, what's called batch, where you basically load a vessel, seal it up, process it, and extract the uh, materials. Ours is a continuous feed. Uh, the discharges that come out of the process are treatable. One of those discharges is what's called a non-condensable gas, which is a fuel that we use to actually go back into the process and feed the burners. So we use that, that non-condensable gas as a, a part of our fuel to uh, fire up the, the vessel itself. Um, from a uh, production standpoint, if you put a ton of plastic into our, our vessels, they'll produce 4.4 gallons per ton. There's a couple of keys to uh, measurements and metrics uh, when you look at a, a, an industry like this. And I'm going to touch on, a, on a, a two, two of the most important ones. And these are the, these are the things that kind of make or break you. Um, it, it's what makes the process, the, 
or measures the efficiency of the process and the productivity. The first I'll talk about is mass balance. Mass balance is basically saying that for every unit that goes into the product, it's got to be an equivalent uh, number of units coming out. In other words, you can't create or destroy matter. So as you break that down and you look at, let's say, 100 tons of, of plastic that we process, we end up with roughly 70 tons of oil. That's a 70% yield. That's what makes our process very productive and, uh, and profitable. Uh, after that, you've got a couple of other byproducts. One is the condensable gas that I talked about, and that's about 18 tons. And then there's a char. There, the char is, is all of the inerts um, uh, that come out of the process. Char comes out in basically a black powder form. It's non-toxic, it's, it's landfillable, and actually can be used in cement kilns and, and things like that. Uh, so that's the, the, the mass balance, and it's a very important question when you look at, at, at these types of, uh, uh, of industries and, and pyrolysis types of process. The second thing I'll talk about is energy balance. And this is the, the, the answer to the question of, you know, what does it take to produce a unit of energy? And for us, it's a real simple uh, uh, math equation. And this is the, this is the energy uh, for processing, for what, what it takes when you're uh, creating the, the, the oil in our case. And we have a 15 times step up. So in other words, for every uh, unit of energy put into the process, we're producing 15 units out the back end. We measure that in BTUs. It's a very, very uh, uh, effective use of, of plastic. And part of that is because of the nature of plastic itself. Plastic has the highest BTU content in the waste stream of any other material. So what's our plan? What's our business model? Um, you know, we've, we are in, interested, obviously, in getting access to that plastic waste stream that's so valuable and, at, and turning that through uh, local uh, pyrolysis plants into a usable product, oil. Obviously, the, there's many, many benefits to that, uh, including reducing our reliance on, on OPEC type products. Uh, and, and there's also some very uh, interesting greenhouse gas emissions. This is not a, uh, uh, we do not emit uh, pollutants into the air. It's not incineration. It's all a self-contained process. One of the, the keys, or uh, not a key, but one of the goals that we strive for is what we call hyperlocal resourcing. And that's of both the raw materials and the products. Uh, the, the, close, the closer we can be to the, the source of our materials, to the feedstock, the better uh, it is for everybody. It lowers our transportation costs, et cetera. Uh, what we look is at the, as, the, as a community of a whole and what feedstock is available. And each community is slightly different. Agricultural has a certain profile. Um, uh, and of course, we want to be close to uh, MRFs, material recycling facilities as well as a source. The other thing that I'll mention is that uh, our product is actually a very uh, high quality uh, crude oil and it's uh, very refinable and we are uh, right now in an R&D process for uh, being able to put what are called micro refineries on site and actually producing uh, a gasoline, a diesel pro type product right out the uh, uh, on site. You know, from a, uh, an industry standpoint, you know, we, we also obviously go through economic benefits uh, analysis for all of our facilities and the jobs that we produce. We, uh, we typically like to op open a two-vessel facility uh, to start, and for each two-vessel facility, it employs about 30 plus or minus uh, full-time people. That's skilled, non-skilled management uh, type uh, labor. Uh, and then from a feedstock perspective, you know, we're extracting uh, roughly four, 41,000 tons an annually on a daily basis. Uh, these are hungry machines. On a daily basis for a two-vessel facility, we're processing 120 tons a day. And on a production basis, that turns out to be uh, about 200,000 barrels of oil produced on, a, on an annual basis. And for each facility, we look, of course, into the future to grow, uh, you know, you can just grow each facility with, with new vessels. 
Now, of course, we're in the oil production business, as I said, and uh, comparing us to other ways of producing that West Texas Intermediate Crude, when you look at what it costs for our production compared to, let's say, taking it out of the ground, uh, you know, our costs are much, much lower. We roughly uh, can produce a barrel of oil all in for around $50 or less. Today's price is in the $95 range, and it's not predicted to go down uh, below uh, $90 over, over the next 10 years. Um, uh, one of the other metrics about our process is, like I said, we, pr we uh, uh, process 120 tons of plastic a day, and each vessel produces 300 barrels of oil, or in a two-vessel process, that's 600 barrels. Just a couple things about the, uh, the company, Res Polyflow, that's our uh, technology partner. Um, you know, from the start, the inventor is still a part of the, the management team, and he's been at this for about 30 years. And uh, he's kind of a mad scientist type of a guy. Um, has been uh, originally looked at this from a uh, solving a problem uh, kind of an issue in, in a business way. And taking what he knew to be in the, the waste stream, what today's waste stream consists of, and being able to process that without uh, uh, a lot of uh, particular uh, picky uh, processes. And that's what he's found and, and, and is now uh, being commercialized. Uh, the, uh, the board of directors and the management team uh, from Res Polyflow and from our company are all seasoned executives. Uh, they all come from various parts of the industry, either the waste side or the oil side. Uh, or the, the, the plastic. Um, a couple of things about the process, when you look at other companies, we're not the only plastic to oil uh, company. There's a handful of us out there. Uh, one of the things that makes us a little bit different is the fact that we can take any mix of uh, plastic. It really doesn't matter, and we've got a consistent product that comes out the end. Another thing that's key is uh, uh, the lack, lack in uh, need of a catalyst. We don't, do not use a catalyst, it's not required. Um, we've got, uh, to give you a sense of where we are in our implementation, there's a full-scale uh, operating plant in Ohio. Um, I call it a, a full-scale pilot plant because it's not a continuous operation, but it is full-scale and has run several times, and they're in the process of uh, making that a full-time operations. Um, just to, you know, to let you know that it's all a patented uh, process in uh, all the countries that uh, we are targeting, and a little bit about our our different various partners. Um, with that, to just wrap up, we've got uh, projects that are moving forward in Arizona and Nevada and throughout California. We've got about four or five projects now that we're all pushing ahead on, including one here in the Imperial Valley. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Let's uh, move next to Dr. Lalor. Okay, my, my apologies. Well, let's go next, next to uh, Bruce Anderson. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, uh, just a, a, a personal, two, two personal notes, actually. <clears throat> um, so I, I attended my first solar conference in 1974, um, there were fewer people than this, but it was a national conference. And so coming here in the, sort of in the middle of nowhere and, and seeing the huge number of people uh, just focusing on, on, on this part of the, of the world is just really, really exciting to me. And I want to thank uh, Carrie uh, Woodland. I wouldn't be here without her. We met in the Middle East. Um, and she said, you got to come to Imperial Valley. And then I came here and, and, uh, and, and, and checked it out, and, and Tim Kelly and Tom DuBose laid out the red carpet for us, and, and, uh, and we've been back a couple times now. We're really delighted to be here. Um, and I'm going to show you why uh, uh, she encouraged me to come here. Uh, 
I'm going to be talking to you about an approach to concentrated solar power that sort of checks off all the boxes of the issues that sort of spring to your mind when I say CSP and, and you might uh, uh, recoil a, a tad. Uh, the great thing about CSP, though, of course, is that it's, it is dispatchable. Uh, and, uh, and we like to refer to ours as firmly dispatchable, uh, responding to demand. Um, and uh, it's also distributed. It's a, it's a standardized, pre-engineered module where all the components are made in a factory, you bring them to the site, and you assemble them like Lego blocks. Not quite that easily. Um, but we can use the waste heat to, uh, and some of the electricity, of course, to purify water. Uh, and it has a storage uh, capability that acts very much like electric storage. So there are a lot of, lot of benefits inherent in this. It can operate as a baseload plant or as a peaker. And with that, really, you can maybe sleep through the rest of the presentation, because I sort of said it all. Um, and what you see here is an ar artist rendition. Uh, we, we call it the Wilson 24 solar plant. Um, we developed our technology uh, with uh, help from the U.S. government. Uh, we completed a $5 million worth of research and development, product development last fall. Uh, now we're doing the final engineering of our prototype full-scale full power plant of 300 kilowatts, 13 hours of storage. Um, so uh, my question to you all, is this a possible next step in the Imperial Valley's clean energy future? And when I talk to people around me about, gosh, you know, we've, we've, we're probably going to put this in California. They say, why? You, it's, it's, it's so hard to do business in California. I said, no, I didn't say California. I said the Imperial Valley. <laughs> it's just so much different doing business here than it is in the rest of California. And I didn't realize that before I came here. And, and uh, it's made all the difference to see uh, how, uh, you know, everybody here is so encouraging and helpful. Uh, so uh, in that question, uh, we have this firmly dispatchable 24-7 uh, power, regardless of weather or the time of the day. Uh, we also include heat, and that heat can be used for a wide variety of purposes. Um, it's usually referred to as CHP, but, but when you're, um, uh, say, you know, on a piece of land in the Imperial Valley, you might use it to, to heat a, an algae pond during the winter when, you, when the production goes down, you need a little bit more heat in the pond. Um, we can use it to clean water, uh, say clean groundwater for, say, irrigation. Um, it could be for an industrial process or for crop drying or something like that. And then, of course, there's the storage. And uh, I'll be showing you the kind of engine that we use, which acts almost like a, an electric battery. It responds so quickly. Very quick ramp up times, very, very responsive to fluctuations in demand. And it provides the grid really a lot of flexible operation. And of course, none of these words apply to the intermittent sources of, of renewable energy. And of course, jobs. Uh, I say manufacturing here, but I say that not because there aren't also construction jobs and other kind of jobs associated with this operation and so on. Uh, but because a lot of the components are sort of off the shelf and they can be made, are already being made locally, and more can be made locally and should be uh, close to the point of, of, uh, of deployment. Um, we also like to call this the duckhead killer. You know, we're sick and tired of this graph. And we propose instead that it looks something like this. Get rid of the duck's head. And you can do that with a CSP system like this that has storage that can operate uh, again, any time of the day and night, uh, and at particularly uh, at times when it's most important to the grid. Um, so these, these are some of the other attributes. I I've, I've, uh, 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 don't think I'm going to repeat them all. I um, uh, haven't said anything about cost. Uh, the the uh, engineering cost study that we did for the DOE when we first started our, our project uh, showed that uh, as a factory production play, uh, think wind and PV, factory production, think big power plants as not factory production, um, we showed a, a very credible path to getting down to power uh, and with not, not including the use of heat now, uh, just power only to uh, the mid single digits, you know, six, seven, eight cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so cost competitive, not out of the gate. You know, we'll be in the 13 to 15 cents initially. Uh, scalable, again, uh, we're 
talking distributed one at a time or a hundred at a time. Uh, it's like a wind farm, let's say. No toxic materials. Um, uh, low water use. Uh, this, is, this is not a steam turbine. Uh, this is a, what's called a gas turbine, a Brayton cycle. And uh, compressed hot air drives these turbines rather than compressed steam. Um, and it's very land efficient. It's one of the most efficient uh, uses of land in generating power from the sun. Uh, and ultimately, of course, it offers stable prices, stable electric prices anywhere that solar and wind and so on are deployed. So, um, a little bit about the company. We're a uh, spinoff from MIT. Um, we're privately financed, also the state of Massachusetts. We love to work with partners. Uh, that's our, our preferred approach, finding the best expertise in the world to work with. And, um, and we've, we've been supported, as I already said, by the, by the federal government in the development of this technology. Um, Rick did a um, more than good job of introducing me. I'd like to call your attention to my, my colleague, who's also at the conference, Jeff Wolf. He just recently joined us as a COO. He started one of the uh, biggest and most respected uh, uh, solar ins installation companies in the country. Uh, grew to a run rate of around 60 million, profitable. Um, and about 18 months ago, uh, he was bored. Uh, every, every day was repetitive, more or less. And uh, he found a new CEO, became chairman, uh, took some time off, and then uh, started looking for his next big thing. Uh, he called me a couple months ago, said, can I come and visit? We spent three hours, he called the following week and said, I found my next big thing. Uh, so PV moving to CSP is a very good sign for us. That was my point. Um, so our 24 solar plant is daytime solar uh, plus four 20 hours of storage, depending on the application, whether it's a peaker or whether it's a base load. Um, and then, of course, fuel backup. A standard dies module, factory produced, targeting under six cents, uh, compressed air. Um, again, we don't, there are no oils, no molten salts, uh, no water use, except for cleaning the heliostats. And we use mostly well-proven equipment. Um, our system is proprietary. Um, uh, we really own this space. And uh, our initial product, and this is a product, just like a wind machine is a product, uh, is 300 kilowatts, unless you want a peaker to shave off, uh, let's say, the, the shoulders of the load, uh, in which case it operates about half the time, but twice as much power. Uh, be distributed uh, as a single module or multiple or hundreds. Um, this is sort of, uh, again, another artist rendition. You can see what's called the solar receiver. Sometimes people call it the concentrator uh, sitting on top of the tower. Uh, that's all that sits there. There are no moving parts up there. Uh, it's just getting very, very hot, 1,800 degrees, and heats the air. And the air goes up and down the tower. Uh, you see the thermal storage sitting there next to it and the turbine on the ground, and then a heliostat field of, of about four acres of uh, tracking mirrors that are computer controlled. Um, that solar receiver is, is very novel, very special, uh, relatively simple. And uh, the German Aerospace Center, which is by far the, the most experienced uh, group of people in this general world of, of Brayton Cycle Power Towers, which is what this is technically called, uh, is our development partner. Uh, Sandal Band, 350-year-old, very, very large company, our development partner on our storage. We're using 100-year-old technology and downsizing it. Um, these are hot stoves or culper stoves in the steel refining business. Uh, basically a silo filled with fire brick, you blow the air down through it, and then uh, when you want to power the turbine, you reverse the airflow from the bottom up. Again, no moving parts. And, and the bottom point is pretty important. Uh, it's very cheap compared with electric batteries. It doesn't, say, it doesn't mean that, that storage is cheap, it means the batteries are very expensive. Uh, and then we have proven off-the-shelf components. Uh, these turbine packages um, are, are mass-produced, highly reliable, millions, tens of millions of dollars of, of hours on them, simple plug-and-play, uh, very fast start, very uh, f fast response, providing flexibility to the grid. Um, and then locally made towers, uh, uh, heliostats from a third party, and then to, to clean water or do something else, you stick something 
on the waste stream of the exhaust of the whole system. And in this case, I'm showing a water cleaning module. So our next step to, commercial, to commercializing this is to build an, an, a, a test facility, a, a full-scale test, a prototype of this plant. Uh, 300 kilowatts that will operate 24-7, uh, four to five acres of land, uh, uh, probably the Imperial Valley, and uh, optional water cleaning, purification, CHP, something like that. Um, here's sort of a quote salt and sea vision, um, a utility scale vision. Uh, on the 60,000 acres, we could put four gigawatts of either base load or firmly dispatchable on-demand power uh, that could um, take the place of these nukes that are closing. Um, so um, people love our technology. Um, and in fact, the more people know about CSP, the more they like it. And so these are two of the foremost uh, CXP, CSP experts in the world. One used to run the CSP program at DOE. Uh, the other runs um, uh, two industry publications. Uh, and I like hers a lot. This is a revolution waiting to happen. Uh, and um, if you want to contact us, uh, if you don't see me afterwards, uh, you, can, you can contact us uh, through this information here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruce. That was fantastic. Our uh, next presenter <coughs> is Dr. Lord, and he's going to talk to us uh, about another solar application, but this time at the, uh, the Water Energy Nexus. Dr. Lord. So, thank you, Rick. Uh, we've just heard the, the farmer Bruce speak about land solar. Uh, what we're going to talk about is floating solar, essentially solar floating on water bodies. So there's no dearth of potential as far as solar goes. I mean, the sun rays, uh, and there's a, I mean, as the map shows you, there's, there's a lot of potential as far as sun, the sun goes. There is a lot of need, and this is just a chart to show you that the energy just for water consumption alone is so huge. Um, all the wastewater treatment plants, for example, they consume a lot of energy in water purification, in flocculating the water, etc. So there is a lot of need for on-site demand, especially where water bodies exist. These are some of the potentials. You can put floating solar on pretty much any kind of water body, from seas to rivers to lakes to polluted waters to anything, except you need to design the system, the materials to suit the water quality, because obviously water is a very sensitive issue. And you need to, for example, if you're a drinking water source, you would not like to pollute the water, so the materials have to be very consistent with the water source. Um, what are the benefits? Um, essentially of, um, of floating solar. So these can be designed to any shape, any size, um, you know, any mascot, anything you want, any motif, I mean. So essentially, we do have a cooling system um, on the panels. So basically, by cooling down the panels, you can increase the efficiency. That's been one of the drawbacks as far as land solar goes, especially after the temperature goes above a certain range. We also have a tracking system. Basically, the tracking system allows, uh, um, you know, to track the brightest spot in the sky to allow for maximum use of power. Uh, and also, you can reduce water evaporation. This is acting like a lid on top of the water body. So you can, especially in a place like uh, Imperial Valley or places around this, because of the sun, I think water evaporation or water savings becomes a critical issue. So. What are the advantages of such a system? Um, again, it's modular. Uh, you can scale it up and down depending upon you know, the, the need. Uh, it can be combined with tracking cooling systems. Again, it does generate a lot of jobs. It can uh, connect it with existing utility operations, so you're not basically changing anything per se. Uh, you, know, you, you can integrate it in urban centers, etc. So that's what we call is the FTCC approach, where we have F is for floating, um, T is for tracking, C is for cooling, and then you see the, the pump spraying the water over the panels, and C is a concentrating system. So again, depending upon the price, depending upon the location, the use, the system is very adaptable. So this is not a standard product that you give. It is very customized to the use. So. 
Um, in the interest of time, I will skip a few slides because I think we are running behind. Uh, so, of course, efficiency, you can increase because of wet, because of cooling, because of uh, using the complete FTC system. So, there are different planning schemes that are possible, again, like I said, any shape or size. Uh, th these, uh, again, different rafts because, again, they float on rafts. Different anchoring systems, again, the systems have to be anchored depending upon the water body. Just to uh, show you uh, a comparison, the red line is a floating, uh, the red line is a fixed plant, and if you look at the green one, it is basically a fixed floating tracking plant. So you can see that there's a big uh, increase in efficiency. So I'll just go through some of the projects that have been done. This is a project in France. Um, again, this is water utility approved. Um, this is another system in Italy. This is a system in Korea. Uh, essentially, it doesn't matter if there is snow or you know, excessive heat, it can still operate. This is on a winery. The entire winery is, is uh, powered by floating solar. This is the irrigation dam that they use to irrigate the plants, but at the same time, the, the power generated is used by the winery. So it doesn't have, the application is not only power generation, it's got many other applications associated with it. This is another one in a commercial complex. This is a project currently being executed in Australia. It is on a wastewater treatment pond. Uh, it basically powers the entire pumping cycle of the wastewater treatment facility. This is another one currently being done in the U.S. Uh, this is again um, a, a, on a wastewater treatment pond as well. And this is another being done with a, in Australia with a water utility. Uh, these are covering the secondary ponds essentially. So this is uh, another 8 megawatt project. Uh, you can, uh, just to summarize, you can combine this with any kind of energy storage system. Uh, you may connect it to grid, you may not connect it to grid because in the U.S. there are different states with different regulations. Uh, it can be behind the meter, it can be connected to grid. So there are multiple possibilities and it's not all only about power, it's about water, it's about remediation, it's about uh, water evaporation, it's about power, it's about many other things uh, that time won't permit. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Our last presenter is Tracy Sizemore from Symbol Materials. And as I mentioned in my introductory comments, uh, their company is looking at an innovative way of extracting valuable materials from waste brine here in the geothermal facilities in Imperial Valley. Tracy. Great, thank you. Let me go right into it. Symbol Materials has access to uh, the brine in the Imperial Valley, which I would argue is one of the largest domestic resources for lithium, manganese, zinc, and potassium hmm. in recoverable amounts. Uh, we have proprietary technology, which I'll talk about, as do each of, you, each of us have, and uh, it's a patented process. It was effectively designed to tag onto an existing geothermal plant. It doesn't have to, but it can. Take advantage of the infrastructure they have with withdrawal and injection wells and after the geothermal plant has produced power before reinjection, we can take the brine stream and extract out uh, the selected minerals that we're looking for. It's a vast resource. If we look at just the hypersaline zone of the brine formation, so it's a small, so it's not the entire formation. Uh, there's about 100 million metric tons of recoverable lithium as a lithium carbonate equivalent about 150 million manganese oxide, 360 million of zinc, and 5 billion recoverable metric tons of potassium chloride or muriate of potash. One of the things that we addressed was a problem with uh, previous attempts. Uh, this, was, this has been tried as far back as the 50s to recover uh, things out of the brine, was our first technology was the ability to take out the scaling materials in one step. This is an example of piping uh, working with the brine and the scaling problems that it created. So our very first step is called brine purification where we drop out all of the scalable materials so that the balance of our plant is dealing with a pure brine stream and we're doing selective extraction. One of the things that we tell uh, investors, we've told, uh, told the, the Department of Defense as an example is compared to other lithium manufacturing, this is a solid U.S. sourced 
uh, production. All of our production and all of our materials are located in the Imperial Valley. Uh, compared to our, some of our major competitors who produce some of it in South America and manufacture it in North America or, or the likes. <coughs> Symbols of proven technology. We have 9,000 hours on a, on a demonstration plant, so we're past the pilot stage. We've gone through the demonstration phase. We've produced 500 metric tons of purified lithium carbonate, which we've sent out to cathode and electrolyte manufacturers. Our primary target for our lithium is the battery manufacturing, and that's because the material we produce and because our process is different, uh, unlike our competitors that produce about a 99 to 99.5% pure product, we produce a 99.999% pure product. That makes a lot of difference in a high-end battery for its performance, especially in, in uh, cathode manufacturing. We also can produce uh, manganese and zinc and potassium. So to give you an example of, a, of an operating geothermal plant, uh, we could produce 15,000 metric tons of lithium carbonate equivalent, about 40 to 60,000 metric tons of manganese and zinc products, and about six to 800,000 metric tons of potassium chloride. So this is a vast resource, um, and our, our plans are obviously to scale up a number of uh, plants. Uh, our first uh, lithium plant goes into construction in August. Uh, locally, that will produce about three to 500 construction jobs, and then long-term, uh, about 150 uh, full-time employees uh, as engineers, uh, operators, and uh, uh, good-paying jobs. Electric vehicles have been driving the battery market as well as uh, grid storage. Lithium being the superior battery for that type of storage and delivery, it's both lightweight and it's efficient in its storage and delivery of energy out, we've seen the supply demand of lithium uh, shift. About, <coughs> excuse me, about two months ago, the tipping point of supply and demand was 2017. Um, in the last uh, three weeks, several car manufacturers have announced that they're also getting into the all-electric uh, vehicle market. So you'll, you'll see a number of them making announcements in the next two months. This pushing that tipping point to 2016, meaning in 2016, the demand for pure or high purity lithium hydroxide and lithium carbonate will well exceed the uh, supply. And so from a market standpoint, uh, our plant is coming online at, at about the right time. If we could get it done a year early, it'd be even better, but uh, that's the way it works. Lithium's used in a variety of products, uh, ceramics, glass, there's any number of them. We chose specifically to go to the battery market because that at a 99.999 purity, um, you wouldn't want to put it into, uh, simply put it into glass. It has a much lower uh, product uh, purity to it. So we're targeting specifically that market because of the quality of the material that's coming out of the process. And so uh, I would tell you that uh, we've, each of them have talked about it. Uh, we have patented uh, <coughs> both the process, the equipment, and composition of matters of the purified brine itself. Uh, we are developing the uh, uh, field. Uh, there's a long-term, our long-term plans are to develop uh, a number of plants and produce uh, uh, about 10 lithium plants to would sustain into the market. Uh, so we're, we're looking forward to our opportunities to develop that. If you have any questions uh, or you had interest in, I am, I am in business development, so I have to ask, if you have investors that are interested in getting in, I would be happy to, to speak with them, or if you have any questions, I'd be happy to provide you more details. Thank you. And at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions from the floor. Anybody with any questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> well, there are a number of brine fields, and uh, the, our competitors actually develop it out of a cold brine field, which adds about $1,000 a metric ton to production costs. So comparatively, our cost structure, we're about a third or half of our competitors in uh, production. First off, because of the concentration 
of lithium in this particular brine as well as it's coming out hot. And so we take advantage of, uh, there's a number of products that I didn't uh, mention, there's other products we'll develop, but just the cost of boiling water is significant in the manufacturing side for that type of processing. So in that sense, the Imperial Valley is very unique and it's, and it has the combination of the right concentrations of lithium, manganese, zinc, and potassium, as well as the temperature in order to make a very cost effective. Uh, so we could take the technology to other locations, absolutely. Uh, the cost, it would, it would, the cost of uh, production would be higher. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Can withstand uh, several meters of change in water levels. Is that your, is that your question? Well, first of all, the system is designed to withstand 80 knots of winds, essentially. Um, that's the standard specification that we have. But again, it can withstand several meters of, uh, again, because it's so highly customized depending upon the water body and the materials used, it can withstand significant changes in water level. Additional questions? Yes, sir. Um, I wanted to ask Tracy, do you have a waste product? That's a great question. The answer is no. Um, we extract selectively the materials uh, out of the brine stream prior to its reinjection into the field. Or anything else for you Yes, sir. There's no waste stream. Any additional questions? Well, I have a question here for Bruce. Uh, one of the things that is always interesting to talk about are the unknowns, and uh, the Ivanpah CSP facility is drawing a lot of attention due to some incidents with birds. Mm. and wanted to see if you had any comments uh, on your thoughts about CSP and, and uh, impact on wildlife. Uh, I, 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 I don't know a lot about the really big scale uh, CSP plants, but in essence, at the Ivanpah plant and these tall towers, uh, you've got the solar receiver that wraps around the tower at the very top of the tower. and. Uh, it's very, very hot. Uh, and you've got a plume of air rising around the tower, going straight up into the air. Uh, birds that fly through that are going to get fried. You also have uh, uh, 180,000 or something heliostats focusing night up on top of that tower. Um, so you have the heliostats creating very, very high density radiation in a fairly large band around the tower. And the same thing's gonna happen when a bird flies into that area. Um, and also with these large systems, you have to flatten the land almost perfectly. So um, uh, it, there really are some challenges with these large systems. We'd like to think that our system is gonna have those problems. Um, our, the heli our, one of our heliostat suppliers has a heliostat that sits, sits on top of the ground. We need small heliostats, in other words, for a small system. And so the design is can sit right on top of the ground without hardly touching it, not even a foundation, uh, no trenches for power or for uh, the computer controls or anything else because a little PV cell operates the the controls and the and the motor, um, and um, and then wirelessly is communicated with. Um, in, in terms of the birds, uh, our solar receiver uh, on top of the tower faces down toward the ground. It's fairly small. You won't, you won't see it from a, a long ways away because it is facing down. Um, the, the numbers of heliostats that are focusing their light upon to that opening in the solar receiver, uh, a bird certainly could get fried, but it's a fairly small area. We hope that doesn't happen, but it probably will occasionally. But there is, you know, there, there are a lot of differences between large scale and small scale in terms of the impact. Okay, thank you. Any ad additional questions from the audience? Okay, well, thank you very much to our panel. Round of applause, please.